seventh installment of our a journey through Jewish philosophy. Um, uh, today's talk is not a simple talk. It's got a lot of um, material uh, I want to cover, so we'll get right into it. And uh, in today's talk, I'm going to take us basically from the uh, beginning of the uh, first part of the 19th century uh, into the 20th century, uh, a period which really forms the core of the issues and concerns of Jewish philosophy uh, of the last uh, of the 20th and 21st centuries, issues that are still very much with us in the way that uh, uh, the Jewish people uh, respond to the challenges brought to them by uh, the wider paradigms of world thought, which is really what uh, Jewish philosophy is trying to do. As I always emphasize, Jewish philosophy is, in a sense, first and foremost, reactive. Philosophy is the idea of uh, how we can construct a picture of reality out of the human mind, and it responds to uh, world challenges. So uh, let's let, let's look at the uh, where we got up to, because the early... <laughs> The end of the 18th century, this famous age of reason that we talked about uh, with Mendelssohn and so on, uh, reason itself, highlighting human reason and rationality, almost becomes a kind of secular religion in itself. And the two great thinkers, I mean, if, if France and uh, England were dominant cultures in world philosophy in the uh, 18th century, then uh, almost uh, definitely the 19th century belongs to uh, German philosophy. The Germans really uh, took the ideas coming out of the 18th century, out of the age of reason, and uh, developed them to great heights in a, a great project called, which we now refer to as the great period of German idealism. And the two big figures, and we have to talk about this for a minute, uh, the two big figures that are sitting at the end of the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century are, of course, Kant and Hegel. It would be uh, foolhardy of me to try and uh, summarize a Kant and Hegel in the course of uh, half a minute, but uh, uh, foolhardy is my middle name, in a way, and I'm going to have to try and do it. But for our, for our purposes... Uh, and just for those who are a little unfamiliar with the uh, immensely influential uh, ideas of Kant and Hegel, in absolute summary, for our purposes to understand going forward, uh, what, they've, what they're basically looking for, Kant and Hegel, are what are, the, what are the laws, what are the universal laws behind human reason and human rationality? How does it actually work? It's all very well to talk about uh, rationality and human reason, but what are the laws that make it work? So Kant's big idea, and in a sense, immensely influential idea, which uh, in many respects we're still living in kind of like a post-Kantian universe, is that our understanding of the world is, really relies on categories that belong to the human mind. Uh, the way objects and reality uh, unfolds itself to us is not because so much of any uh, particular essence that those objects or entities have that determine the laws by which we understand them. Everything happens in the human mind. The categories of time, space, quantity, quality, attributes, all these things happen in the mind. It's a big shift that's going to have a lot of implications. Hegel, on the other hand, now, oh, and Kant argues that, that, that what the thing is in itself, you can never really know. Everything that you know about it is all happening in the mind. Knowledge cannot be attributed directly to the entities or objects that you are experiencing. Whereas Hegel uh, takes the very area that Kant says you can't really go to, and that's Hegel's starting point. For him, uh, reason is a great spirit, a geist, as he calls it, uh, that is evolving through history and is revealed to humanity through history, uh, through the famous processes of thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. Those people who, those of you who are interested in going into the um, into the thought of Kant and Hegel, uh, you're you're well invited to uh, to walk that well trodden path. But in essence, this is what Kant and Hegel are doing. They're attempting to uh, determine the 
universal laws of reason. And one of the thinkers I'm going to mention today, but I can't really go into in detail, I think probably it needs a whole other talk just to go into this, but I wanted to make mention of Nachman Krochmal, who is not as well known a name as perhaps he should be, a, a big name in Jewish philosophy, because he's dealing mostly in the philosophy of history. And I have mentioned Krochmal uh, in the context of some talks I've given on history. Uh, Krochmal's idea, whereas uh, Krochmal's telling you that whereas most all nations go through three basic stages, he's very influenced by Hegel and the idea of how uh, Geist and, and, and spirit is, is revealed through national histories. So whereas most nations go through uh, three stages of birth, flourishing and decay, the Jewish people uh, go through four stages. They go through birth, flourishing, decay, and rebirth. The Jewish people are vouchsafed that unique quality of being able to rebirth themselves in history. And uh, I mention that because uh, Krochmal's philosophy in his famous book, uh, Moren Vuche Hazman, which is uh, clearly taken uh, as a parody in a way on the Maimonides book, Guide for the Perplexed, so Krochmal wrote guides for those who are perplexed about the times. And Krochmal is writing in the first half of the 18th century at a time where the world uh, really is changing and uh, the Jewish people are, in a sense, being reborn. What we see in the first half of the 18th century is the rise and, and uh, influence of something we mentioned last week, which is the Haskalah, sometimes wrongly translated as the Jewish Enlightenment, uh, where Jews are starting to discover uh, a whole range of world culture that they are trying to incorporate into, uh, into their own. Uh, if we have a look at this particular uh, graphic uh, that I've done here, um, I'll be able to show you... Uh, let's see, here we go. Uh, what I want to show you is what I'm going to talk about uh, today. I'm just going to uh, situate Krochmal here in the first half of the 19th century. Uh, and uh, the Haskalah is in full force, and the Haskalah is going to be followed by the, this, this uh, intellectual emancipation, if you like, is going to be followed throughout the course of the 19th century uh, by political emancipation for Jews, and that's going to have a whole effect. But the three thinkers I really want to talk about today who are immensely influential in 20th century and 21st century Jewish philosophical thought are, of course, Cohen, Rosenzweig, and Buber. I, I really should point out that they are not the only philosophers that are wandering around, but in a course like this, I have to pick the three most influential and try to get to terms in the brief time that we have with the essence of what they're saying. So uh, the first person I want to look at is, is Herman Cohen, and Herman Cohen is a fascinating uh, figure. He was, for much of the latter part of the 19th century, kind of like the one of the dominant uh, philosophical figures in, in Germany, and he belonged to a school which is roughly called the Neo-Kantian school. These were philosophers that took the philosophy of Kant and developed it further. Uh, Cohen's particular idea uh, about Kant is uh, it's like almost like Kant on crack. I mean, he's arguing that uh, nothing about that reality uh, out there, so to speak, actually even exists outside the human mind. I mean, Kant would have told you it exists and the human mind processes reality in a certain way. But uh, Cohen was going to the, uh, the other extreme, saying it probably doesn't even exist. Everything happens uh, in the human mind. Uh, everything we're not, we, we, there's absolutely nothing that we know about anything that's uh, what is actually outside the human mind. It's just this is the way that the mind processes reality according to the Kantian categories. There's a massive discussion and not really relevant uh, today uh, to what I'm going to talk about, but it shows a background of someone who was deeply embedded in German idealist thinking. And then what happened was, having been professor at Marburg and the most uh, eminent neo-Kantian thinker in, in Germany in the 19th century. In his older age, uh, around about the age of 70, which is not necessarily old, but it's a bit older, um, uh, Cohen suddenly remembers 
that uh, there's a God in the world. And this is a very, in, a, in some ways, an ironic uh, realization to have in the midst of this, the massive secular emancipation that's happening across Germany. But basically on retirement, uh, Cohen revises all of his philosophy, very brave thing to do, and rethinks everything. And uh, Cohen produced a book that wasn't actually published till just after he died uh, in the early 20th century, but a famous book called Religion of Reason out of the sources of Judaism. And what, Ka what Cohen is basically arguing there, and the immensely influential book, and I'm gonna uh, just pick on one point of it as to show why it's influential, uh, is that it is in a sense a revision of German idealism on the one hand. So that, so that uh, uh, Cohen is saying, well, idealism is fine for the ideal individual, but, uh, religion is actually for the individual person the individual person embedded in a reality with real existential concerns and when we say existential concerns uh, i should have actually pointed out to another very very big moment in german in in in, in european and world philosophy that happens in the uh, middle of the 19th century uh, due to a danish philosopher that uh, a number of you will have heard of called soren kierkegaard Kierkegaard's shift is really what we call the beginning of the existential track of philosophy. And Kierkegaard's basic, Kierkegaard was not Jewish, don't get confused, Kierkegaard was not Jewish, but he's living in the middle of the 19th century. And this existential revision of the dominance of Kant and Hegel's thought goes something like this. It's all very well for them to talk about the universal principles of reason, but what does that mean for me? I mean, Hegel's very impressive, says Kierkegaard, but I'm a religious man. When I read the Bible, the story of Abraham annihilates me. The, uh, in his famous book, uh, Fear and Trembling, Kierkegaard talks about this dilemma that Abraham has, that on the one hand, he is pursuing the ethical and the moral and the good. And then along comes his God and says, I want you to sacrifice your son to me. This moment of conflict between Abraham's pursuit of the good uh, in a moral sense, in other words, following his own ethical and moral reasoning versus the demands of duty made upon him theologically within the context of his belief in God come into conflict. So Kierkegaard shifts the starting point to the individual and their embeddedness in the world and their, the factuality of their actual existence. And therefore begins what we call existential philosophy. Back to Cohen, at the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century, Cohen is similarly revising uh, the universal picture of idealism to try and uh, work out what it means for Judaism and for a person who is Jewish and wanting to reconcile all of those ideas. And what he comes up with is very, very profound because uh, Cohen basically says to you that I have realized that on the other side, <laughs> the other side meaning out transcendentally, outside what we can know about reality from inside the human mind. Uh, whereas before, before, Kant tells you you can't know it, and I was saying before it's not even there, basically. Uh, I've realized that it is there, says Cohen, and what it is, it's God. And God is the grounding of all being. In fact, God, there are only two things that exist only two things that exist there is being and there is becoming this is cohen's famous philosophy of correlations god is being god is the grounding of all existence the grounding of all being humanity and the world they are facets of becoming and all intermediaries that we perceive between us and god are facets of the relationship between being and becoming. 
They're not independent entities. Whether we're talking about the Holy Spirit, or we're talking about the Logos, or we're talking about any of the other ideas we've looked at, these are not independent entities, says Cohen. They are simply facets of this correlative relationship between the ground of being, which is God, and, be, and, and, and the realm of becoming, which is uh, the, the world and humanity. Now, that's a tremendous summary of, of Cohen's thought. But uh, that, that, that of itself, as we're going to see, is going to have a tremendous influence. And one young um, Jewish philosopher upon whom Cohen's uh, revisionist project became extremely influential uh, was someone who I think is probably the most important, perhaps, or, uh, the word important is a difficult word to quantify, but possibly the most influential Jewish philosopher of the 20th century, even the 21st. And that, of course, is, uh, put your, put, don't call out, put your hand up if you know who I'm about to talk about. Put your hand up if you know who I'm about to talk about. Someone who met Cohen, deeply influenced by him, studied with him. He was a young man, Cohen was an old man, and went on to write a book and to develop a series of thoughts that's going to become overwhelmingly influential in Jewish 20th century Jewish philosophical thinking is, oh, well, that's good. That's good no one put their hand up because, that I can see anyway, because that gives me a reason for being here. And I'm talking, of course, about Franz Rosenzweig. So Rosenzweig, Rosenzweig emerges, I mean, just Rosenzweig's uh, biography itself we could talk about for some time because it's so fascinating. And I have spoken about it elsewhere, but I'll just run over the basic details to give you an idea of who we're talking about. We're talking about someone that comes from a very uh, eminent uh, intellectual academic Jewish family that during the course of the 19th century, of course, had become emancipated and had become uh, highly secularized. One of the things that was happening in Germany at the time during the 19th century was they're saying, okay, well, Jews are equal, kind of, but they're not really equal. And in what Jews were finding is that, yes, it's all very well to run around and say, oh, we're equal, we've got equal rights, but you don't really get anywhere in society. You can't really get tenure and you can't really get any of the good positions and really secure status in German society of the 19th century as a Jew unless you made some form of outward conversion to Christianity. Christianity was still, Protestant Christianity was still the dominant cultural discourse of the 19th century. And many, many Jewish families converted to Christianity. It wasn't really a conversion so much of theological commitment. It was just something you did. In fact, these people were so secular that it didn't even bother them. Uh, to go uh, and, and convert just for the sake of their uh, professional and cultural status uh, on Facebook or whatever. So, uh, but the Rosenzweig family was a family that for a long time had resisted that, but some cousins of Rosenzweig had converted and so on. And anyway, he finds himself in uh, around 1912, 1913, Rosenzweig finds himself in some deep discussions with people and he makes the decision that he can't theologically justify being Jewish anymore and he's going, or just Jewish, he's going to convert to Christianity. But, says Rosenzweig, before I do that, I'm not going to walk into the church, said Rosenzweig, as a pagan, I'm going to walk into the church, into Christianity as a Jew. Therefore, I'm going to go to Shul. I'm going to go to the synagogue on Yom Kippur. I'm going to make peace with my father in heaven. And then as a Jew who's just come out of Yom Kippur and had my sins atoned for in the traditional way in Judaism, I'm then going to convert to Christianity and walk into the church as a Jew. And this is a very, very noble idea, except that uh, Rosenzweig went to Shul on Yom Kippur. He spent the day in Shul in Berlin 
and is that experience uh, which uh, deeply affected him for the rest of his life, he realized that uh, conversion to Christianity was not going to happen, that everything that he sought was in fact uh, found and justified in Judaism itself. In fact, in one of his, um, uh, one of his fantastic uh, quotes is that uh, the Jew does not need to seek God because he is already with God. This is the essence of Rosenzweig's epiphany in shul in Berlin, in a small shul on Yom Kippur of the year 1912 or 1913, this realization that uh, he was already standing as a Jew in the presence of God and that uh, everything that he was looking for was already there. But he had only just started to develop those ideas. And then he met with Herman Cohen, and Herman Cohen was teaching at a, a higher education institute uh, for Jewish learning um, in Berlin. And uh, Cohen was already very advanced in years, but um, Rosenzweig became close to him uh, and basically did a journey of what we would call, what, what Rosenzweig called Teshuva. He was the first real kind of Baal Teshuva of the 20th century. And he started coming back to sources and uh, lifestyles uh, that were more authentically Jewish and really immersed himself in Jewish learning extensively, but continued to write philosophical works. And the big, big work that emerges from Rosenzweig's thoughts uh, was a book that he started writing in the trenches in World War I, because he was fought for the German army in World War I, and uh, especially in the years 1917 and 1918, uh, as he's sitting in the trenches, <laughs> being bombed by Bodash, probably, uh, he's writing notes on uh, postcards and sending them back home uh, in case anything happened to him. And of course, those notes that he wrote from the trenches formed the core, this is why Rosenzweig's biography is so fascinating, formed the core of the book that is, uh, became known, or well, he called and published as The Star of Redemption. And The Star of Redemption is a massively influential book in 20th century Jewish thought. And I'm going to summarize a big fat book. I've got it in the other room. I didn't bring it, but The Star of Redemption uh, is a very common. You, you basically, as, as has been said by many people who've read Star of Redemption, you basically have to be familiar with the whole of the German idealist tradition. And that's a big tradition because it goes from Kant and Hegel through to Fichte and Schelling and Schopenhauer, and then it gets exploded by Nietzsche and so on. You have to be familiar with that to really understand uh, a Star of Redemption on one level. But on another level, it's a, it's a book as complex as it is, it's actually reducible to a very simple set of propositions, uh, which are this. And, and just before I go into Star of Redemption in detail, I should also add that uh, Rosenzweig's biography is so fascinating because it involves all of the stories that I mentioned and more. But apart from that, from 1921, 1922 onwards, uh, Rosenzweig started suffering from ALS uh, and a motor neuron disease that eventually took him, and he died in 1929. Uh, and for the last few years, uh, all of his writings and all of his outputs were done by uh, use of a device where he would indicate simply with his head to his wife which letter he wanted to, to have typed and so on. So it was just an incredible story. But, uh, and also, he, he's going to spend much of the 1920s working on a very, very famous translation into German of the Torah that he worked on with Martin Buber, who I will speak about in a few moments. So what is Rosenzweig's big idea? So Ro what Rosenzweig is wanting to do, not, not so dissimilar from what Kierkegaard was proposing and what Cohen was also uh, aiming towards, and that is a revision of the whole of the universalist picture coming out of idealist philosophy of the 19th century. And 
replacing that universal uh, set of propositions with uh, a picture that took into account uh, the particularity of the Jewish person uh, living in the world. In fact, any human living in the world who was attempting to understand uh, the relationship between God and the world uh, in, in, in the light of, or, of, uh, of a universal um, understanding of reasoning. So I, I'm, I'm, go I'm going to talk about this and then I'm going to show it to you because I've done a graph, it's easier to, uh, to explain. Uh, Rosenzweig basically says, what, what's really going on? I mean, with everything that's been said and done in philosophy and the thought and this attempt to ameliorate world philosophical thinking with Jewish reality, what's really going on? There's only three entities. That's all that exists, just three entities. There's God, there's the world, and there's humanity, which... Philosophers in the 19, uh, early 20th century still calling man. Don't get upset at the word man. Man is just a word for humanity. So there's God, the world, and man. They're the only three. The, real, the God, the world, and the realm of the human. And those three entities are intermediated by only three processes that are going on. There's only three processes going on. Revelation, creation, revelation, and redemption. This is, this is building, this is building on Cohen's idea of being and becoming. There are grounded entities and there are processes. And what Rosenzweig does is he shows you how this works. So God and the world are revealed to each other through the process of creation. God and the human through the process of revelation and the human and the world through the process of redemption. And through these processes, this is really where these entities meet. God and, the, and man meet in revelation. God and world meet in creation. And the world and man meet in redemption. This is a revision of the whole of the universalist picture of philosophy from the point of view of either a Jew or a Christian, someone coming with this theological background of revelation to understand uh, what is actually happening in the world. One of the interesting things is, is that um, there is a, a very fascinating contrast to be made in a sense between uh, Rosenzweig and Cohen's project on the one hand and Krochmal's on the other, because Rosenzweig uh, is in a way notably ahistorical. When I say ahistorical, it's Krochmal is all about historical consciousness. Uh, Cohen and Rosenzweig are kind of ahistorical. They're looking for a universal picture. And Rosenzweig even goes further and tells you that the people of Israel are actually outside the whole stream of history. In that stream of history, all the nations of the world are flowing towards the end of days. But the Jewish people are outside that. The Jewish people actually, just like Rosenzweig himself, found himself already in the presence of God on Yom Kippur, the people of Israel are already, in a sense, liturgically and spiritually in the presence of God. They have already arrived at that point. It's not, it's, 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 it's not the way, for example, the Rambam would say, you know, 800 years earlier, that uh, Judaism... Is a, is, is a science that the rest of the world science is trying to catch up, but this is from an existential point of view. The ideal manifestation of revelation and reason and, uh, this, and is, is found in Judaism, and uh, 
Judaism in, in its pure sense is not subject to historical circumstances. This is a this is an influential point because um, I don't know if you heard about it, but the Jewish people are going to undergo in the 20th century after Rosenzweig some very very impactful historical processes. But in the 20th century, uh, we've got um, this thing called the Holocaust, and uh, uh, we've also got uh, the uh, State of Israel, which are enormous historically impactful events. And that's all I was referring to, uh, uh, and, and all of their attenuated details, of course, uh, is what I was referring to. Uh, there is a sense in which Rosenzweig might have been thinking that uh, having arrived at the 20th century, uh, full emancipation, secularization, now it's just a case of trying to realign uh, Mendelssohn's project uh, with, uh, with reality and uh, that the Jewish people can just go forward and universalize their religion. Uh, and uh, it, it wasn't to be the case because, uh, uh, look, Rosenzweig was also not terribly excited about Zionism. Uh, he recognized that the Jewish people needed uh, to find a place of safety, but he didn't find uh, the program of Zionism. He didn't believe that Judaism's answer was in finding a political uh, status for itself in the world that would be similar to other nations, the classic anti-Zionist argument, uh, but um, uh, Rosenzweig didn't see much of the 20th century and uh, those positions um, uh, would be perhaps revised even by him today. Nevertheless, uh, there is uh, another philosopher. So while, while, while Rosenzweig is, is uh, struggling with ALS through the 20s, he has developed a very, very interesting and fascinating friendship with the other big Jewish philosopher uh, that I want to talk about coming out of that kind of uh, emancipated, uh, slightly less emancipated, but more, but perhaps a little bit more uh, traditional, uh, but German Jewish background of the 19th century. And I'm talking about Martin Buber. And Buber's thought is immense. Uh, I think that perhaps of all the thinkers I'm talking about today, perhaps Buber is the most influential uh, and he's influential not only on Jewish philosophy, but very much on Christian thought as well. Uh, and I want to touch upon uh, Buber because Buber, uh, in the early, early 20th century, uh, Buber, who, by the way, already at the, uh, at the age of 21, was already a, a, a spokesman delegate to the a Third Zionist Congress. So he was already from an early age, an ardent Zionist, uh, a much more traditional background than Rosenzweig, much more learned, uh, but was um, much more interested in philosophy than in uh, traditional Jewish pursuits. Although he found, uh, he discovered, um, in his 20s, he discovered Hasidism. Uh, and he didn't become Hasidic, but he became fascinated with Hasidic culture and the way that Hasidic culture was able to express many of the existential ideas that were emerging in late 19th century philosophy as a result of the uh, revisions of, 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 of uh, universal idealism. And uh, he was fascinated with that. So some of you would be familiar with Buber's uh, writings on Hasidism and his adventures into that. He saw the Hasidic community as, as in a sense, an ideal existential community. Uh, and in other ways that I'll talk about in, in a few moments, he, he saw that in that some people have criticized Buber because he said that he took all the uh, exciting and idealistic parts of Hasidism, but uh, left out some of the things that perhaps uh, uh, are not so savory. But nevertheless, that was a huge part of his journey. He worked with Rosenzweig on the translation of Torah and so on. So uh, Buber is a major figure. Uh, Buber eventually um, came to Israel in the in, came to Palestine in the late 30s and was very much around until the 60s as a leading intellectual figure. But Buber is most famous for his book, which summarizes his thought, and that is the book. Ich und du, the book I and thou, I and you. And basically, it's like this. Uh, there's only really, uh, well, the, the, <laughs> the, 
people would tell you, well, you know, Rosenzweig's picture was very clever, but uh, really there's only one thing going on. And uh, that's a process. And that process is the process of revelation. And revelation is a presence by which the other is revealed to you and by which you were revealed to the other. And what we need to do, says Buba, and what needs to happen, and, and there, there are two types of ways in which human beings relate to other things and other people and other things. Either we have a relationship that is an I-it relationship, that means I relate to something as an it. It is an objective entity. And I can talk about it as an it, whether it's a person or a thing. And there are many it's in our world. But true presence and true revelation only happens when we relate to things as you only second person relationships and being open to second person relationships reveal other and ultimately reveal God because in every second person relationship in every you we get a glimpse of the eternal you and I it sounds like a very, very simple idea. It sounds like an idea that a five year old would have in the bath, but it is actually one of the most incredibly influential uh, ideas in 20th century philosophy. And let me show you, um, I made a graph because I like this. And even if you don't like it, I spent a while making it. So I like it. All right. So uh, this is what Buber wants us to arrive at. He wants us to arrive at an understanding where our relationships with other are at the level of you, not at the level of it. Things can't always stay at the level of you. They kind of move in and out towards you and it. But our ideal is to treat everything that we come across as a presence, as a revelation of other with whom we can have this ideal relationship. And that's where, that's where free will truly takes place when we raise relationships with other uh, to the second person. You is the pronoun of presence. Not it. I, it relationships objectify. I, you relationships reveal. And then Boob is going to take that and he's going to show, I mean, Ich du I and Thou is a, it's not a long book. It's an essay. You could read it in a couple of hours. It's a beautifully written book. But over Boob's uh, career, he takes this fundamental idea and he applies it uh, to a great many things that are fruitful uh, in the existential tradition. And for the existential tradition means that something that, starts with the factuality of a person's existence as the starting point. Not the great big rational reasoning of Kant and Hegel, but the very simple fact of where do I start from? What is, what is my reality? What are the things that, that I'm dealing with in, in, that, that, are, um, that we can understand philosophically? And Buber's contribution is immense. And incredibly influential, not as I said, not, as I said, not just in Judaism but also in Christianity. And that, in a sense, is why Buba found the, you know, the, the the communities of Hasidim and the Hasidic way of life so appealing. Also, its mystical underpinnings, where and particularly uh, the thought of Rabbi Nachman of Bratslav and so on, where people are encouraged to have conversations with the divine on the level of you, to actually call God you and to have a dialogue with God and to speak things out in God's presence. That is the ultimate I-you relationship, says Buber. But what he wants us to do is to take that relationship and apply it uh, as much as we can to everything that we encounter, to have second person I-you relationships. Buber and Rosenzweig disagreed on a great many things, not simply on, on Zionism, but they 
they disagreed on quite a number of philosophical positions, uh, although Buber owes more to Cohen, perhaps, than, 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 than he often admits. But they were, they were great friends and they were great collaborators. And in fact, it was uh, Buber who, uh, who read uh, Psalm 73 at uh, Rosenzweig's funeral. So these three thinkers uh, that I've covered in extreme brevitas, uh, Cohen, Rosenzweig, and Buber, are going to be very influential on the subsequent thinkers of the 20th century that we're going to uh, touch upon next week uh, as the century unfolds and raises even greater uh, existential concerns. If we were to look at the challenges facing, and we always like it's always useful to look at these philosophical ideas in terms of the of the challenges facing uh, the philosophers themselves. So uh, for Cohen um, and uh, Rosenzweig, it is an attempt. The challenge is really coming from the the very nature of secularity itself. In an age of emancipation, in an age of rampant secularity, how can I make the factuality of my Judaism meaningful. There's no point, says Cohen and Rosenzweig, in going over to uh, a religion that, um, to another religion, simply because it's a dominant cultural discourse, especially when in Judaism we already find uh, the sources for uh, a very, very profound understanding of the notion of revelation in the world, and that there is a universal picture emerging from Judaism. Unfortunately, uh, in the 21st century, many people have, and I'm gonna get in trouble for saying this, many people have lost sight of that universal picture. I think that it would be worth us going back to look at the writings of Rosenzweig, and to some extent Buber, to understand that a Judaism contains within it a, a spiritual discourse that is universal, that can apply to the whole world. It is not merely uh, the product or the parameter of a particular people. There is something in Jewish ideas about creation, revelation, and redemption that uh, need to lead the world to a better place. And Rosenzweig and Buber uh, were both very much understanding that that is the role of the Jewish people. The role of the Jewish people in the world is to reveal that universal thrust within Judaism uh, to bring all the world uh, to a better place where uh, the presence of God uh, is revealed both uh, universally and individually. So uh, I encourage you to simply use that summary as a, as a launch pad and to uh, look into the thinking uh, to maybe even uh, look at Star of Redemption, look at I and Thou, and uh, understand the importance and influence of these philosophers and how in many ways uh, we would be well to come back and uh, revisit them. And also uh, it's important uh, going forward to, uh, to understand that. So I'm just gonna finish off now going back to the gra first graphic I showed you, which is the timeline, just to, so we can understand exactly where all these thinkers are embedded. And you can see that while emancipation is going on, uh, secular thought and science is running rampant. We've got Marx, we've got Darwin, the world is changing. And eventually even emancipation ends up even with Herzl uh, around about the turn of the century. But Cohen, Rosenzweig and Buber are building a different picture. They are building a picture of a Judaism that can tell the world, uh, uh, fulfill its ultimate mission, the mission entrusted to Avraham and the Avot to tell the world about the presence of God. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed the talk. For episode notes and transcripts, or to learn more about David's next classes and projects, visit davidsolomon.online. You can also find David on Instagram or Facebook. Thank you. We hope to see you again soon.